So I get to give my talk seated. The secret is to bring a piano. Um, allow me to introduce Edward Elgar, English composer, conductor, educator, and wearer of a most excellent mustache. And if I can make that a call out, I'll be very happy. Uh, so our story starts on October the 21st, 1898. Edward returns home to his wife after a long day of teaching, which he called, and I quote, like turning a grindstone with a dislocated shoulder. <laughs> after dinner, in a mood, as you can imagine, he lit a cigar and he sat down at the piano to doodle. Now, if this sounds familiar, um, you've probably seen a movie or two. Um, but in 1898, it was brand new, so come with me on a trip and let me show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. So, we imagine Elgar sitting at the piano, he's improvising this theme, and his wife, that's her, Carolyn Alice Elgar, poet, author, interrupted, saying, play that again, I like that tune, what is it? And Elgar answered, it's nothing, but something might be made of it. And this turns into a game. Elga says, guess who this is, and plays the tune in the style of one of their friends. And then Alice says, oh, now do Hugh, or William, or Dora. And at the end of the evening, Elga has the basis of 14 variations on an original theme, as he titled the manuscript. He dedicated the work to my friends pictured within, and wrote in pencil over the theme, the word enigma. So what is the enigma? The first obvious puzzle is the question, who are these friends pictured within? The uh, variations have titles that are mysteries like HD, S, A, P, Nimrod, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. <laughs> Turns out, given that lots of the titles are simply the friends' initials or nicknames, um, we can work this out pretty easily. Um, Variations 2 and 12, for instance, are musicians Hugh Stuart Powell and Basil Nevelson, with whom Elgar played chamber music. Variation 4 is his patron, William, William Meath Baker, and so on. Variation 13, that's asterisk, 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 is a bit harder. According to Elgar, the asterisks take the place of the name of a lady who was at the time of the composition on a sea voyage. And we generally believe this is Lady Mary Ligon, who at the time was on a ship thank you, to Australia with her brother on the way to be governor of New South Wales. But there's another enigma. In the program notes for the premiere, Elgar wrote, I have sketched for their amusement and mine the idiosyncrasies of 14 of my friends, but this is a personal matter and need not have been mentioned publicly. The variations should stand simply as a piece of music. The enigma I will not explain, its dark saying must be left unguessed. Through and over the whole set, another and larger theme goes, but is not played. So the principal theme never appears, even as in some later dramas, the chief character is never on the stage. So what is this principal theme? <laughs> Elgar dismissed all the solutions proposed during his lifetime. The last one is... That was, uh, God Save the Queen was the suggestion of his friend and um, incidentally variation number eight, Arthur Troity Griffith. Um, Elgar responded, of course not, and then added, but it is so well known that it's extraordinary, no one has spotted it. <laughs> and with that, Elgar died in 1934 and we 
really start guessing. In 1953, the Saturday Review magazine hosted a guessing contest. People wrote in with suggestions like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and Loch Lomond and an aria from a Mozart opera and a theme from Brahms' Fourth Symphony, a movement of the Pathetique Sonata. Turns out this matches one variation in particular very well, number nine, Nimrod. And there's a reason they match so well. Nimrod, the mighty hunter of the Old Testament, hunter in German, Jäger, is Elgar's friend and publisher at Novello, uh, Augustus J. Jäger. Some years earlier, Jäger had visited Elgar when he was about to quit composing because he was doubting his abilities as a composer. Jäger told him to be more like Beethoven, who also had his doubts, but continued to compose immortal music and illustrated his point by singing the tune of the second movement of the Pathetique Sonata. So yes, that theme is in there. But no, it's not the solution to the enigma. Another red herring among the friends is George Robertson Sinclair, whose variation 11 and a well-known organist. Sinclair's skill with the pedals was well known. And in 1960, English musicologist Jack Westrop argued for a passage from St. Matthew Passion, the Bach St. Matthew Passion, imagining Sinclair playing it on the pedals. Um, it's towards the end where Jesus is on the cross and cries out, My Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Except... Sinclair was also known for being inseparable from his bulldog, Dan. Seriously inseparable. <laughs> and the story is that one day, walking with Sinclair and Elgar along the River Wye, Dan fell in, paddled upstream to find a landing place, and let out a rejoicing bark when he got out. In Elgar's own words, GRS said, set that to music. I did. Here it is. There's even a plaque on the bank of the River Wye to commemorate the event. In 1970, British musicologist and cryptologist Eric Sams proposed Auld Lang Syne, even though Elgar himself had rejected that solution. In 1984, master violinist and conductor Yehudi Menuhin announced from the stage at Carnegie Hall that the solution was Rule Britannia. Mainly, I mention this to show that photo of uh, me meeting the maestro in 1991, the New York Times published a British pianist solution, the second movement of Mozart's Prague Symphony. Clearly, things are getting out of hand. In his 99 book on the Enigma Variations, Professor Julian Rushton called all this deciphering a postmodern mingling of scientific positivism with fantasy. Fantasy, more than. Rushton, Rushton uh, made a list of five clues that Elgar had uh, left during his lifetime and decided that this was what needed to be satisfied by any solution. Um, the solution must reveal a dark saying, it must find another and larger theme, it must go over the whole set of variations. This is all from the program notes from the premiere. Uh, it must involve a theme that's well known enough to explain Elgar's surprise that no one had spotted it, and it must explain a remark Elgar once made about a falling musical interval in the theme. Rushton's point was, there's no point searching for a solution you're not going to find it. But it turns out that people who love a puzzle love a checklist. <laughs> and there's lots of people who like a good puzzle. 
Uh, Cleveland policeman Mark Pitt, for instance, who announced in 2016 that the solution was one of Liszt's symphonic poems and got written up in The Guardian and The Daily Mail and The Times. He reached this conclusion after years of working on the so-called Dorabella cipher, a secret language that Elgar and his friend and variation 10 Dora Penny used to communicate. This is a real thing and it remains unsolved to this day uh, despite the internet's best efforts. <laughs> oh, hi, Mark. Um, in fact, the internet is full of would-be enigma solvers. For instance, Robert Paget, a Texas violin teacher who spends his free time trying to solve the enigma and writing an extensive blog about his reasoning. The latest post discusses the significance of Elgar's tempo marking of 63 quarter notes per minute, not 62 or 64, as according to Paget you might expect. Um, notice the number three, if you turn it backwards, kind of looks like an E, like Enigma or Edward or Elgar, or, or Ein Feste Burg, a Lutheran hymn that Paget believes is the solution for this and similarly sound reasons. He's also found, <laughs> he's also found anagrams, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Felix Mendelssohn, the Shroud of Turin, and Jesus in the music. It turns out, given enough data, you can pick and choose evidence to support any theory you like. <laughs> so let's get back to what Elgar himself actually said about the theme. The variations should stand simply as a piece of music. The enigma I will not explain, its dark saying must be left unguessed. So having heard some variations on the theme of people puzzling to solve the mystery, let's leave Elgar's enigma unguessed or unknown and finish with Summer Variation 1, Alice Elgar, without whose encouragement we wouldn't have this wonderful music. And then a toast to Edward and Alice and all their friends for managing to keep their private jokes private despite all their fame and over 100 years of professional and amateur sleuthing. <laughs> Thank you.